Can you hear me? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, so this is based on two papers with these this cast of characters. Um, so let's get started. Um, so, uh, so here shows you know what we've been talking about the trajectory of a heavy ion collision at high temperature. Um, say the LHC, we supposedly go from a re from a QGP with, with restored chiral symmetry to a region of broken chiral symmetry, the hadron gas, with a crossover transition. Okay, at one one sixty or one fifty eight MeV. Okay, um, and so the, the the characteristic feature right is that this is a symmetry breaking transition. And yet this symmetry breaking transition sort of plays really very little role in any hydrodynamic description of the heavy ion data, except for the equation of state. Um, so the goal of this talk is to try and study that, okay? See what we can do, if anything, okay? Um, so first, you know, in order to begin the discussion, I'd like to just sort of briefly review, like what is a pion, right? So if I have a Q bar Q, which develops the expectation value, that's like a magnetization of all the spins align. Okay, that's how I sort of think about it. Um, Q by Q is you know, called sigma typically, right? And now a global rotation of the, of the chiral condensate by an angle phi naught costs no energy you know, if the symmetry is broken, right? And then finally, um, if, if the angle changes slowly in space, you know, that costs only a small amount of energy proportion to wavelength, okay? And um, is that slow excitation of the phase of the chiral condensate that is associated with, with, the, with the pion, right? And so the pion is this slow excitation of the chiral condensate, the angle. Okay, um, so we normally characterize the wave function of the pion by this SU2 phase, okay? So in chiral perturbation theory, this is called U, Okay, and it's into the I phi. Okay, so now once you have chiral symmetry breaking, chiral symmetry restoration, then as we know from statistical mechanics, then the magnetization, or in this case, what we call heat for side, for side by side, begins to fluctuate as you approach TC. TC and you know the order parameter is you know this chiral susceptibility, the square of side by side on expectation value, okay? Um, and so now if you're close to a critical point, then there is a scaling prediction for how this uh, susceptibility should change, okay? And so uh, here I show lattice data um, for this chiral susceptibility. And what do you see here? Okay, so this is uh, the chiral susceptibility is a function of quark mass, okay? So this is a large quark mass, and this is a small quark mass. The quark mass apply, looks very much like a magnetic field. Okay? Um, and what you see is that as you lower the quark mass, the chiral susceptibility um, increases okay, as you approach kind of a critical point. Okay? Um, now, uh, the physical world is sitting here okay, and this green line. And we are going to be stuck in that physical world. And nevertheless, we're going to start to try and look at what what the consequences of this chiral fluctuations could be. Now, what's exciting about this curve is if you compare it with O4 scaling predictions, okay, so if you have a critical point, then you have a universal function, and this, this, this curves should behave in a universal way, which depends on the quark mass and the reduced temperature, T minus TC over TC. And it's maybe too, clear, too soon to say, but um, there is a statement that it is consistent with this O4 scaling predictions um, and hot QCD collaboration is quarter to critical temperature of 140 MeV. Okay, for us, um, the pseudo critical point is here at 158 MeV. Okay, the main thing you should take away though is that somehow the lattice is seeing the O4, or at least knows about the O4 critical point and then hydrodynamics and in the hydrodynamic description of heavy ion data, we should know about the O4 critical point too. Okay, so that's sort of motivation. All right, um, so let's start talking about hydrodynamics with broken chiral symmetry. Um, so you have approximately conserved quantities, the, the stress tensor baryon number isovector charge, okay? And the approximately part is the isoaxial vector charge is only approximately conserved, okay? given by this quantity, it's the, in the high temperature phase, it's the difference of 
left-handed up quarks minus right-handed d quarks, okay? And that's approximately conserved quantity, okay? Um, then, of course, in the broken phase, um, you develop magnetization, and these long wavelength fluctuations of the pion field um, are arbitrarily long. They don't decay very rapidly. And so you have to include them into the hydrodynamic description of the, uh, of the, of the system, okay? So the, the order parameter here is sigma times mu, mu is the space I talked about, e to the i phi. Okay, so we're gonna write down some hydrodynamic equations, including the, the phase and, and closer to TC on uh, the order parameter as well, okay? And just use that hydrodynamic description of this phase and, order, and, 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 and magnitude of the order parameter to make some thoughts, okay? Um, so fortunately, the, the theory with just the phase was written down many years ago by Son in 1999, okay? And closer to TC, um, you would start to include the sigma dynamics too, which actually turns out to be earlier, even earlier, okay? Um, so, uh, so let's get started here. So here's the basic picture, okay? Um, so oh, I somehow missed this last point. So we are, if, if you have a finite quark mass, then these terms, these, the, the, the phase angle, which will need a finite mass term, and then the Goldstone modes and this conserved current will start to decay at large distances. Okay, and not be included in the hydro description. So here's the, here's the picture. Okay, so at long distances, with the wave number is much, much smaller than m pi, then you get back ordinary hydrodynamics, okay, that we know and love. Whereas at shorter distances, where modes of momentum of order m pi, then the sort of fluctuations of the pions and the order parameter need to be included, okay? And at still shorter distances, then you'll have the regular half on gas, okay? Um, as you go up, it's closer to TC, okay, then, you know, you also need the sigma and then the, the the pion and the sigma should both be included in these critical modes that you're going to include into your hydrodynamic description. Okay, um, so we're going to start to ask how these, these superfluid-like modes or these critical modes contribute both to the viscosities and the diffusion coefficients and also the, uh, the pressure. So let's start with the pressure. Okay, so that's sort of simple. Um, so if I write down, you know, the partition function, and I, I would normally integrate out the hard modes and get the pressure, okay? But now I have these soft modes, which I should include, and I should include the, the, the integration over those soft modes, right? And that can be kind of done in dimensionally reduced chiral perturbation theory. So I would sort of integrate out the hard modes, be left with a three-dimensional theory, which describes the soft planet excitations. And now I would write down on an effective Lagrangian, which describes, you know, those soft fluctuations. So, um, the effect of Lagrange is very familiar from chiral perturbation theory and involves two, two coefficients in the chiral limit, just one, okay? And when the mass is included, a second one. Okay, so the angular fluctuations, the total pressure from both, you know, the hard modes and the soft angular fluctuations, you know, takes this form. And once you know the, so to say, static part, you can start to write down the fluid part, okay? Um, Okay, so just as a swift comment here, the dependence of the parameters, um, such as the uh, F squared, M squared, has a known dependence near TC. And we're gonna use those known dependencies near TC to make some predictions for the behavior of the fluctuations. Okay. Um, okay, so returning to this pressure, we can find the equation of motion. But I need to address one more thing before we go do that, okay? So let's look at the um, let's look at this chemical potential, and that chemical potential is related to the derivative of the phase of the of the angle. Okay, and let's sort of see where that comes from. Um, it's known as, known as the Joseph constraint. So the point is that if you have are going to develop a VEV of the chiral condensate, you know that is charged, and it's also stable, right? And so that means that if I take the chiral condensate and compute it with the grand, you know, compute its commutator with the grand partition function, right? That needs to be zero if this thing is going to be stable. Okay. And now we can use then the transformation properties 
of this thing. I mean, this commutator is the derivative of the, of the, of the order parameter, and these cause rotations of the order parameter. And then you get a simple relation known as the Josephson constraint, which relates um, the derivative of the phase to the chemical potentials, okay? So in linearized form, it just says that the time derivative of the phase is equal to the, the chemical potential. Okay. Um, so now, once I have specified that, we know the, uh, oops, I know the um, pressure. Um, it has this time derivative of the phase and this uh, extra parts coming from spatial gradients. Now you can go ahead and derive um, using a sort of standard procedure from, from Jensen um, that you just treat the pressure as, a, as the effective action for the hydrodynamic equations of motion. So varying the effective action with respect to the metric produces some equation of motion, okay? Um, with some extra terms coming from this kind of stress. And if you then add a gauge field, taking the derivative of the action respect to the gauge field um, produces a current. Okay, with some extra superfluid like current associated with the time equation of motion. Finally, because, the, because you have a mass term, um, you do, the, the current is not exactly conserved, and you find sort of partial conservation of this extra isoelectric current. Okay, so now let's um, start to look at the dissipative parts to the equations of motion. Um, okay, so we have here the, the uh, partial current. Axial current conservation. We have the Josephson constraints, and now we're going to start adding the dissipative parts following these gentlemen. Okay, so the ideal current consists of this gradient of the phase, and now the first viscous correction involves this axial conductivity, first gradient of the chemical potential. Okay, and similarly, the Josephson constraint, right? You would start to expand in gradients. It turns out that there's naively two forms that would enter. One is proportional to the gradient squared. The other is, has the mass term, which is treated like a gradient, okay? And, but however, it turns out that if you analyze entropy production, require entropy production to be positive, these two coefficients are related to each other, okay? And that was the bit from us, okay? And it turns out that there's actually only one coefficient there, which is non-trivial, okay? So there's actually two equations of you know, two, two dissipative coefficients, one for the chemical potential and one associated with this phase. Okay, um, so finally, to reach equilibrium, you would add noise and you would then get some stochastic hydrodynamic equations of motion which for this propagation of the axial current and the propagation of the phase by. Okay, um, all right, so let's look at some of the solutions. So if I look at this straightforwardly, the, the equation motions are quite simple and you can linearize around equilibrium and look at the properties of the solutions. Okay, so let's first discuss a little bit about that. Okay? So if I linearize the equation of motion, you know, just look for the poles and, and the propagation of these pion waves, you do find the, um, a propagating pion wave. Um, the velocity of these waves um, this dispersion curve takes a very specific form, okay, where this velocity, which will play an important role in what I'm talking about, um, is the ratio between the spatial plan decay constant and the axial charge susceptibility of the temporal plan decay constant. And, you know, so the point would be that this dispersion curve is a prediction of the ideal hydrodynamic theory. Okay? So that's really the remarks of these plots. Um, now, I would say the pion velocity itself, you know, really has a very simple interpretation, right? So if you look at this chi um, in vacuum, you know, this chi would be just F squared, but at finite temperature, there's a, a finite correction. What's happening is that some of the axial charge is, is stepping away from the pion mode and into some higher hydronic states. And this correction then, you know, which makes, the actual susceptibility larger than the decay constant. Okay, and so what you can see, you know, after some study, is that this exit, this pion velocity, has a very simple interpretation. It's sort of how somehow the fraction of the material which is in the superfluid component, namely the pion fields, divided by the super plus normal components. So okay, this is the super plus normal. Okay, so it's very natural that as you go near TC, okay, 
this piece should should go to zero. Okay, and so the plan velocity is going to drop near T C. Okay, um, so you can formulate this as a Boltzmann equation. Okay, and so we heard from Misha how you could formulate the hydrokinetic equations um, from a given hydrodynamic stochastic hydrodynamic theory. And here we're going to go do the same thing now for this um, this set of pi n degrees of freedom. Okay, so. We have, so just to summarize, okay, so we have this hydrokinetic equations of motion for the pines. Um, that gives us some stochastic hydrodynamic equations of motion, which we know we have them in our hands. Then if you look at how this, how the two-point functions of those stochastic variables evolves, like we should did, right? Um, no, that would be interpreted as the phase space density of these pion modes. Okay? And so you can ask how this space space density evolves um, from the hydrodynamic equations of motion. And of course, not terribly surprising, you get a sort of ordinary looking Boltzmann equation that results from this hydrodynamic description. Okay, so here's this Boltzmann equation. Okay, and on the right hand side, you get some collision kernel, um, which relaxes the system towards equilibrium. Here, this equilibrium being classical. Okay. You, okay, so let's just pick out the pieces here. So first of all, what enters there is the, is the pion dispersion curve that we already talked about, okay? Um, so it has a universal dependence uh, um, on near TC, okay? And it can be determined from Euclidean measurements in, in the lattice theory. And so that's gonna be very useful for doing some phenomenology, okay? It's as fundamental as anything else. I mean, it's, it's the equation of state, okay? That determines this dispersion curve itself momentum, right? So it really is very, very fundamental thing. Um, then, um, you know, as we said, the hydrodynamic has two dissipative coefficients. Those enter into this um, relaxation time-like equation for the, the distribution of this line field. Okay. Um, so let's now, so we now want to go use this Boltzmann equation, right? Together with the known dependence of omega and Q on temperature um, to make some predictions, right? Um, to work with it. So before we do that, we're going to extend it, right? So this is, this is really only for the phase and really only relatively well below TC, okay? So as you get up towards TC, then of course the amplitude fluctuates and, and you need to include that, okay? So we're gonna extend this description to include the sigma, and that's the next step here. So essentially, I'm, I'm gonna be fairly brief here, um, and, but I'll just sort of just describe a little bit of what's going on. So essentially, we're gonna follow the same steps, okay? We're gonna write down an effective Lagrangian near the critical point, first in equilibrium, okay? Not hydrodynamics yet, okay? Um, the effective Lagrangian has a contribution from hard modes, be sort of like the regular part of the pressure close to TC, and, and a contribution from soft modes, which would be the critical contribution close to TC. So the full pressure, right, has this regular part close to TC. And then in this case, you know, close to TC, you would have a lot like Landau Ginsberg form for the form of the pressure um, close to TC. Okay. Um, again, um, so when I show numerical results, that will be with a mean field approximation where you approximate the sigma with some mean values plus fluctuations, okay? Um, but of course, uh, you would wanna go beyond that in the future um, and go beyond a mean field approximation. Okay. Um, so once you have the hydrodynamics, once you have the pressure, you can essentially follow the same steps that I outlined um, to derive the hydrodynamic equations close to the critical point, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go through that in every detail, but I'll just sort of show roughly how it works, okay? Um, so again, the spirit would be, we have the pressure, we treat it as an action, okay? Then you vary the, the, uh, the action to find the equations of motion, and you find sort of after doing this low temperature, um, derivation enough, you find some sort of relatively familiar, okay, <laughs> looking equation. So you have some, one equation for the derivative of the phase, which is equal to the chemical potential, that's the Josephson constraint, 
And then you have viscous corrections to this Josephson constraint, which are familiar from the previous computation. Okay. Now this phase is then coupled um, to the conservation of partially conservation of, of axial currents. Okay. So here I've driven down one of written down one of the equations of motion here. Um, it describes how the current is coupled to the order parameter sigma. Okay. Um, Good. So we have a, a set of coupled, you know, equations for how the phase propagates close to TC, and um, okay, and, and in addition, an equation for the amplitude, which I will only discuss a little bit. Okay. Um, and now we're going to go try and look at what the solutions are. Right. What are the solutions? All right. Um. So we have the equation of motion in hand. Well, I don't know why that happened. Okay. Sorry. Can you see me, my slides? We see your screen. Oh, now we can see them. Yeah, okay, good. You're back um, to business. Yeah, so uh, we have here this propagation of the phase, equations of motion now for the axial current, or here I just wrote the left hand piece of it, um, and the phase. And let's go look at what this predicts for you know, how the current propagates, okay, as a function of temperature goes to TC. Okay, so what we did there is then use those stochastic equations of motion to compute the axial current current correlator um, as a function of frequency. And so, um, okay, so let's sort of tear it apart here. So well above TC, you know, the phase is irrelevant, okay, there is no order parameter, okay, and you just have a normal diffusion equation of quarks. I mean, you have u left minus d right, and each of those diffuse, okay? And essentially you get a very simple diffusion-like equation for that conserved charge. And that's this top line here, okay? Um, as, the temperature, as the temperature decreases, which I label here by z, okay, which is t minus tc, um, then, you know, the, the condensate begins to build up that couples with the propagation of the current, okay? And then, you know, the coupled co oscillations between the phase and the current leads to um, a sort of pair of propagating peaks here, which we associate um, with the pions, okay? So well below TC, you see here this uh, you know, propagation of pions, and, you know, well below TC, this, this will match with the kinetic theory of pions, which I wrote down um, earlier. And so it's sort of, you know, somehow this critical point dynamics is, is kind of helpful, right? So, I mean, this may be the only case where you can sort of rigorously compute how the QGP will hadronize into sort of soft, um, soft pions, which then are matched to a Boltzmann equation and be, can be continued going on, okay? So in the future, one would like to solve those equations numerically and really calculate all of that stuff, how much exactly, how much yield you expect, okay, for the hydrodization of soft parts. All right, um, good. So now the next step, right? So you, you have the propagators. Okay, well, let's ask how this affects the momentum transport. Okay, so, you know, you have this equations of motion for this sigma and the chemical potential. Okay, and you can integrate them out and find the influence of these modes on the transport parameters of QCD in the crossover region, okay? Um, so, okay, so we did that. Um, I will talk only about this conductivity, okay? I'm um, near in the crossover region. So integrating out these modes, you can, um, you can work out how the conductivity depends in the crossover region. So you have a regular piece, which we don't predict. So it's just a constant that we don't know, okay? And then you have this shift, which comes from integrating out the soft pion modes, okay? Um, and so what you see there uh, is kind of, you know, a, a, a prediction for how, you know, the connectivity should depend um, in the crossover region, okay? Um, so if you look at the absolute magnitude, so then we tried to make some estimates. So this is kind of prediction, okay? The curve, this dashed line is this result here. Okay. Um, so can you, uh, you, you have talked about 35 minutes. Can you? Yeah, I'm almost done. Yeah. So. Okay. Me, very good. Very good. Let me go here. 
Okay, so what I want to say is it's small. It doesn't look large. Okay, that's the main thing I want to say. So I'm going to try and finish up here. Um, and I, um, so let's look here. Is there another way you could look at this? Uh, and it doesn't seem like it, it back reacts significantly. The fluctuation of the chiral condensate back reacts significantly on the order parameter. Um, so um, I count 25 minutes, not 35. Let me check my clock here. 12.30 we started, right? And so now I'm at 25. So, so the uh, including discussion is, uh, uh, now you started at 12.30, so you're at 35. I got 10 more minutes, nine minutes. Nine, eight minutes more now. Okay, okay. go ahead. <laughs> let's not, let's not discuss, <laughs> let's move forward. So, okay, so is there another way, you know, you could look for the fluctuation. So clearly the back reaction of the order parameter on the conductivity is sort of small. But you could actually look just directly for the fluctuations or the order parameter in the heavy ion data. Okay. And so, what is seen in a lot of hydrodynamic simulations, not just um, here I picked one example, but there are many. And I, in the slides, you'll see a bunch, in the online slides, you'll see a bunch of other examples from other hydro codes. And they, they all sort of fail to reproduce the yields of soft pions here at small momentum. Okay. Um, and you know, it's quite hard to change that because you see, it's not just that it's not just the yield that the total yield is easy to change. It's the shade that it's soft momentum. It suddenly, suddenly sort of shoots up, and that's relatively hard to fix. Okay, um, you can try with more resonance decays, chemical potentials, maybe some bulk viscous corrections, other things. Um, but you know, it doesn't depend on centrality. Um, and it's an enhancement, so it's hard to fix it with both those two corrections. Okay, let me profusely, profusely apologize. I misread my clock. You still have eight okay. minutes until, so, until the discussion period starts. So, uh, so okay, you know, um, so that seems exciting for us, okay? And that's because um, we expect an enhancement from the superfluid theory, right? So if I look at the, the if I take the, the pion, distribution function, and I take its dispersion curve, take massless pions, for example, okay? Then you see that uh, omega Q is VQ, right? And so, and V goes to zero, and this is small, right? And so when V goes to zero, this is, you know, T over VQ. And so the yield then like basically goes to infinity as, this, as you approach this critical point, okay? Of course, as you get too close to the critical point, then the, the, the kinetic theory is no longer valid, okay? Um, and so you would trust this stuff and you would need to do a proper simulation, okay? But let's go ahead and try and use this kinetic theory right to the boundary of applicability, okay? Um, so, um, so we tried to do that. So we have to try and estimate this dispersion curve now, including the mass um, as best we can, okay? So we have here, the velocity, velocity at zero is the prediction of, of ideal hydrodynamics, okay? And the pole mass at, again, at zero um, is the prediction of hydrodynamics. And both of them scale with the, the chiral condensate, Q bar Q, okay? And since the chiral condensate is dropping, you know, both of these parameters scale with uh, the chiral condensate, in this case squared, in this case the first power. Um, and so, you, you have a lot of measurements that constrain the value. This is already known, okay? And um, this one is, is pretty largely well known too, okay? So you actually know, well, this is a very reasonable estimate based on lattice data for what you expect the velocity of zero momentum to be, okay? Now, of course, we are only, this is only valid at small momentum, right? So this is sort of small range validity. And as you go up in momentum, of course, the hydrodynamic theory doesn't, Apply anymore, right? And so uh, you have, you know, we would expect this to get cut off, right? And so, of course, you could do better, right, if you went from ideal hydrodynamics to second order hydrodynamics. And so, roughly speaking, I mean, this is a cartoon, but I, I expect it to look something like this. Like, this is the ideal part at zero momentum. And then, if you did second order chiral hydrodynamics, you would have some correction to the dispersion curve, which would be positive, okay? which would bring you back up to one. I mean, at high momentum, you should be back to normal theory, okay? Um, and so, uh, right. 
And so anyway, so a good thing to do would be to classify the second order coefficients and work it out, okay? But we haven't done that. This is just a cartoon an estimate. This would be the ideal piece. If you add the second order piece, it would, in, it would probably increase, probably in P, like P squared. And we just put lambda as a free parameter. Of course, if you go higher, um, you know, eventually the theory just completely sleeps down. And so we sort of chop it off about here. Okay. Um, right. Um, so if you take this, what I consider a fairly reasonable estimate for these dispersion curves, you know, you can make a prediction for the yields in a thermal gas. You know? No resonance decays, nothing yet. Um, well, I can talk about it later. Um, so we're going to take this modified dispersion curve um, with, the, with the modifications that I just described and, we, and plug it into this formula. And you can find the ratio of the expected critical yield relative to the vacuum yield. And so, OK, so at least in our model trust region, right, you get kind of 30 30 ish percent. Um, 50% enhancement um, of the expected yield, okay? Um, so you can try and do better and we're working on it. And I think all things point to good, good science, okay? Um, and so uh, I basically think it could work. Um, so uh, anyway, just as comparison, you know, it's not outside the regime of validity. I mean, it's not sort of out of whack. It looks sort of roughly okay. Okay, so it's encouraging. Um, as I said, it's just pines for a bath at rest. Um, nevertheless, I, I think it's, it's on the right track. Okay, so just uh, some musings from ongoing discussions. Um, so what are we thinking about now? Um, so, you know, the next question you said, we predicted the one body yield. The next question would be, can you predict the two body yields? Okay, and so are, the, are these soft pines correlated with each other? Um, my naive answer from the hadron resonance gas is no, right? Because if I take like a thermal row, it will decay into a soft pion and a typical pion, right? And somehow then the correlations amongst the soft pions are, are small, okay? And similarly, you know, also these are very, if you look at the same sign correlations between plus plus and minus minus, those are also, you know, quite small in the hadron resonance gas. So what is measured so far is sort of say the two point functions of the plant wave functions, right? So what we measure are the plant densities, the square, right? Um, and that goes with the correlation length in some specific way, right? And now much of the discussion about the kurtosis um, from the critical point search can be applied here, right? So the correlations amongst the soft plants should scale as like the kurtosis that I mean, so, so somehow you, know, you have now you're comparing two, two pi densities, this P and K, that's now uh, a four point function, which scales with the correlation line uh, to specific power. Um, so this, like I said, this is just musings, but we are calculating that and trying to uh, um, maybe find some uh, predictions there for the correlations among cell plants, which are, seem to be different from the head and resonance gas. Um, good. So um, if I summarize, okay, so we wrote down this appropriate SC2 left, SC2 right superfluid theory for the plants. Um, in our paper, this is very cursory. Our paper, we included the nonlinear forms, viscous and mass corrections and noise, and did it all properly, um, covariantly, and all that. Um, uh, we determined how the ordinary transport parameters depend on, on m pi. So below TC, this is really rock solid theory. Um, above TC or near TC, we used uh, you know mean field and other stuff, and so that could be revisited um, and find the behavior. But it seems that it's small, so it's hard to find the motivation to uh, to revisit it too much. Um, we determined a, a kinetic equation for those soft ions from the equations of motion. And you know, that is a useful tool. We, we used it right up to the boundary of validity. Um, and it seems to produce the right sets of enhancement. Um, but again, we're pushing it right up to the boundary of validity. And what we'd like to do is actually simulate the thing. Fortunately, we developed an 04 scaling theory in hydrodynamics, which can be simulated. And there's a lot of unexplored phenomenology and pure theory with this theory, which you could use um, and study. So thank you.
Thank you, Derek, for a very, very nice talk. And again, let me profusely apologize for adding some completely unnecessary stress to your life here. You were perfectly on time. I couldn't have done it better. So uh, open for questions. So let me start by um, asking, um, how confident are you in your in in the magnitude of your effect that you okay, have calculated? Thanks. So, okay, so that's a you know a completely fair question, right? Um, and so let me try and say a few things, which I am. I mean, this value of this v and m, you know. M in particular is known. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like known. Okay. Uh, and V will be known very shortly, right? Uh, so there won't be any freedom there to adjust V at this point, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the very near future, right, uh, that will be fixed, right? Um, with a similar precision to the equation of state. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that is helpful. Um, now, of course, then the second order terms, hard, hard to know, I mean, you would need to estimate it, right? Um, and of course, so, but nevertheless, if that will really help this prediction here. I mean, so yes, you'll have some uncertainty coming from changing lambda, the cutoff of when this is valid, but nevertheless, in some range, you can sort of at least pin down this lowest point, right? Um, yeah, so, so yeah. So you're, what you're saying is that natural values of lambda lead to a value for the disappearance of this effect, which could actually be consistent with what you see in the data. Right. Now, how you get that? Well, in principle, maybe not impossible. At least some of the coefficients you could get from lattice, maybe. But that has completely yeah. unworkable out theory. I mean, it's kind of like determining finite temperature Lutvieler L coefficients, which the lattice is doing. Right at zero temperature, so um, so in some sense, you might be able to constrain the range of these next coefficients, at least this stuff. Right um, now, of course, like we said, I'm using the kinetic theory, which is pushed right to the boundary of applicability, right at the critical point, right, and so or to the critical point, which is not when it's used, right. So if I go back and look here, you see, I mean. This was this calculation we did. This was the full result, okay, in the mean field. And this was the prediction of the pine kinetic theory, right? And so, you know, it's right to the boundary of applicability, like I said, right? Um, and so, nevertheless, you know, that's where there's work to be done. I mean, you can simulate that in an expanding system, and it's a lot like the FRW, you know, Friedman Walker, Odyssey Walker universe. And essentially the plan patternization will help happen on its own, right? And then you will get a prediction there um, from this critical dynamics for the plan yields and also their correlations as you go through this uh, critical point. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that was, that was sort of you know, what I was saying, right? That in principle, this transition, which we did in mean field, you could actually like, Imagine Z, the, the temperature from the TC, changing as a function of time. And then the amount that you will get, okay, how much is in this peak at the end will be a result of the simulation. Yeah, so that would have to be done in um, like a hydro plus frame, like framework where you couple the time evolution of this correlation with the hydrodynamic evolution. Yeah, so you would, exactly. So you would have some background hydro temperature which would do be evolving, and then you would evolve the, the, the evolution of the, of the order parameter um, and the actual current on top of that. Yes. And, and you would get a prediction for those yields, right? Um, and are, there, yeah. are there any other questions? Rob. Hi, Derek, very nice talk. I just wanted to ask, could you go to slide 21, please? 21? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've definitely seen uh, data from Elise where for cans and protons, they go to lower PT and they see an excess, which is not as strong as for pions. But I think we could agree. Now for cans, you could say, well, that's another pseudogoldstone boson and protons, it's definitely smaller. But that evidently with these new, exp by going to lower B fields, they can go to much lower transverse momentum. And I mean, looking at the all... excess, at low yeah. PT for all particle species would be an interesting and useful thing for yeah. both theory and experiment. However, I do think that this is the latest, greatest data. I mean, the half of the people on this paper are experimentalists and uh, they are all in Elise. No, so no, the latest, no, 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 there's so, an Elise paper that has no, from both kaons and, and protons. And, and uh, you know, so I do think this, this is, is the latest, greatest. And, uh, uh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send and, uh, it to you. But and, I think uh, we can agree that looking at it for all particle species would be useful in discriminating different models. Yes, and, and of course it really is only the pions and the cans. I, I think it's already too heavy. I, I, I'm not gonna argue that the kaon is another pseudo goldstone boson, right? No, uh, no, that's fine. But there's definitely so an excess. It's really, it's only the pion. And if it's really an excess in all particles, then that's something that's not for us to describe. Right. Um, there right. could and be so, several things, but uh, anyway, that was just a comment. Right. Any yeah. other nice comments talk. or questions? If not, let's thank uh, Derek once again and move to the last talk in this session, which is Radoslav Rip.